Explore the fundamental role of microbes in the natural history of our planet with Microbes in Evolution, the world that Darwin never saw. Available at estore.asm.org. This week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This week in Microbiology, episode number 40, recorded on August 24th, 2012. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from San Diego State University, Stan Malloy. Nice to be here, Vincent. Good to see you. Haven't seen you in a long time, Stan. No, absolutely not. And it's particularly nice to be here at Cold Spring Harbor. Yeah, we're at a really special place, which we're going to tell you all about in a moment. Also joining us today, two special guests from the University of Iowa, John Kirby. Hello. Nice to be here. How Great are you? Great to be here. Great to be yes. here. Thanks for doing this. We oh, appreciate yeah. it. It's, it's awesome. And also joining us from the University of Wisconsin, at Madison, Vaslav Subalski. Glad to be here. Cold Spring <laughs> Harbor is my home. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. So we are here, we're on Long Island in the state of New York, in Cold Spring Harbor, New York, at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, a very famous molecular biology laboratory. It has a storied history, so we're really lucky to be here. We are in the Carnegie Library, and this happens to be the Shabalski room. And I think this is named after you, isn't it? Looks that way. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, uh, a painting of you here, uh, which looks like 2009. Yeah. Did you pose for that, or is it from a photograph? I posed to the, it's oil. And next to a piece of DNA, right? Yes, because I thought I like to be next to the DNA molecule. <laughs> so this is great, and plus we have the right water as well, because uh, Professor Szybalski, of course, is from Poland. Uh, so everything has fallen into place, right, Stan? <laughs> now, why are we here at Cold Spring Harbor? Of course, there's a meeting here this week, and in fact, I have a, a, a name badge from this meeting. It's called the Meeting on Bacteria, Archaea, and Phages. This is going on all week. And uh, I think Stanley had picked this week to dedicate uh, Cold Spring Harbor as a milestones in microbiology site. Uh, and that is because, um, well, I, I'm going to let you explain this, Stanley. What does it okay. mean to be a, a milestones yeah. in microbiology? So site? milestones in microbiology chooses certain places where things happened that, that had a huge impact on microbiology. Um, microbiology is influenced by what's going on in labs all over the world all the time. <clears throat> But there are a few key places that just kind of flip the switch in the way we think about certain things in microbiology. And Cold Spring Harbor is an interesting place because Cold Spring Harbor, it's really the, the birthplace of molecular biology and molecular genetics. And it all started with phage and, and bacteria. There's been wonderful research on bacteria here, actually on development of, of penicillin producing strains, early work on on mutants was done here by Demeritz, and there's been a meeting that's been going on, influenced generations of scientists. And so Cold Spring Harbor is one of the places that had a fundamental impact on microbiology. And it's interesting because I think a lot of people around the world think of Cold Spring Harbor as mainly being a place that has had a focus on eukaryotic viruses and cancer, and they don't realize the core influence of this place on bacteria and phage. Also, don't forget maize and transposable uh, elements. Uh, yeah. Ma many things happened here. Can you think of one thing that you really liked that came out of here, John? It, from the, on the bacteria side? Any or? side, any oh. side. Jeez, lots of things. Okay. Certainly the, uh, the advanced bacterial genetics course, right. which evolved from all of the research going on down in, in Delbrook Laboratory. 
So the, the milestones um, involves putting a plaque at the site, right, Stanley? Yes. What's the, what's the purpose of doing that? Uh, it's to make, to help people remember for years and years beyond the event. I think it also provides a connection between the American Society for Microbiology and the place. The, the, there's this permanent connection once you have that historical plaque right. there that ties them together. So you might be interested to know previous sites are the Waxman Lab at Rutgers, very mm -hmm. important place for antimicrobial discovery, Hopkins Marine Station in California, uh, University of Pennsylvania Laboratory of Hygiene, Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and Tulane University School of Public Health. So there haven't been a lot of sites. That's so correct. you're discriminatory in, in giving them out. <laughs> and here, uh, the plaque will have a, a little inscription on it. And I have a little copy of it here. It says, Milestones in Microbiology Site, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, since its opening in 19, 1890. Not 1980, 1890. <laughs> the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory has made rich contributions to microbiology through research and education. And so there's a paragraph describing uh, what's been done here. And I don't know if this will be on the plaque, but there is a photograph of Max Delbrook and Salvador Luria sitting on a porch here. So this is a very famous right. photograph, which I'm sure you guys have all mm -hmm. seen. And they will be on the plaque. They will be on the plaque. Right. So these right. phage biology pioneers, Delbrook and Luria, and uh, Luria was president of ASM in 1968, and this photograph was taken in 1953. And, and two important things happened that year. Can you, do you know one of them, Stanley? Well, one of them was uh, <laughs> Watson and Crick yeah. released the structure of DNA. It that's was right. a very important year. And I happened to have been born that year, and that's not very important, but it just it probably got me into science, I think, that I was born in that year. And these two individuals shared the Nobel Prize in 1969, along with uh, Al Hershey for their phage research. And they all worked here at one time or another. Did you know some of these individuals? Hershey, Delbrook, Luria, you must have, right? Yes. These were all my contemporaries. Hershey was about eight years older than me or 10. Mm. But he was a very remarkable person. Very quiet, but very efficient. He was happy when his experiments worked. He was <laughs> unhappy when the experiments couldn't be repeated. But he was a very serious scientist and very quiet. In his lab, there was total silence. You have to get in and just listen to silence. And he was giving just instruction quietly to Martha Chase which his collaborator. In fact, in this room, right over there in the glass case, there is a blender uh, that supposedly Chase, uh, Hershey and Chase used in their experiments. It's amazing. It's yeah. right here. It's right, right behind you mm -hmm. in the corner. There's a little letter with it. And there's actually a lot of historical stuff in this room that's interesting. There's the letter uh, from uh, Hershey when he was offered a job here talking about how much money he would be paid. And then there's the blender behind it. So I, and really how much was it? Yeah. <laughs> he was paid. He yes. says he wouldn't take less than nine or eight thousand yeah, dollars. Eight thousand yeah. dollars. Which I was surprised Sorry. because Demeretz was director told Anne's me head. that he was getting only six thousand as a director. So, they don't have that. <laughs> so it's in the right hand case, uh, in the main case, all the way at the right side. There's a letter, and it's in, in front of a uh, a steel uh, gray colored blender. Yeah, it's just amazing, the history that's here. In fact, this room is full of history mm -hmm. uh, of all sorts, all kinds of letters. There's a case here when this place began, uh, the, the establishment of this, this research institute. So I think it's great that we're in this room, and of course, that it's, that it's your room. Do you come here often to this room? Well, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> then I was every day, because I was doing work with a librarian, we were preparing something. So I was here every day since I came in this room for at least a few hours. So, so while you're on Hershey, mm -hmm. one of the things I always tell students about is this idea of Hershey heaven. <laughs> Maybe you could tell us about Hershey. Well, that's what? what he says, Hershey heaven. That's uh, what an experiment he designed works. I, I, and actually, <clears throat> there was dedication here of Hershey room. Uh, Hershey 
uh, building, mm. the first one, because that was destroyed, there is a new one. But when it was presented to him and there was a little reception, he says, what I experience now, it's a Hershey heavens. So that was also another time of pleasure. Mm -hmm. The, the way I heard the story was that Hershey said his idea of heaven was to have an experiment that worked and be able to do it over and over yes. every yeah. day. <laughs> That's right. That's right. The, uh, maybe over and over means it was repeatable yeah. <laughs> because something works but not the next time. Right. Graduate That's student purgatory. <laughs> but he expanded to it. He says it's Hershey heaven that, that they dedicated a building to him. Because there are many heavens. So this, um, one of the important areas of research that went on here, as you mentioned, was phage biology, which really began here in the 40s with Delbruck and Luria. And one of the things they did was establish a phage course, right, which ran for many years. And the idea was to get people in the field. You know, have you taken this course or taught yes, in this course? Yes, I did take it. In 1951, but it started in 45, mm -hmm. so there were already a few of the courses, so there was already tradition. The first two or three Max Delbruck was teaching, and then it was taken by Mark Adams. Mm -hmm. He was a very good teacher. And they really brought up, taught the new generation of virologists, new generation of bacteriologists, these courses. Uh, you, I, you guys haven't taken the phage course, right? Mm -hmm. But did it did it change into some other course at some point? Well, there are many other added. There was micro, advanced microbial genetics. Right. That was the second after phage, and then there were more added and added because they were so successful, and also field was mm -hmm. developing based on molecular biology and not on description how many legs insects have or something like morphological. So, so correct me, but my, the way I understand the history is that one of the key things, so Max Delbruck and a number of the key people early in the phage business came from physics. Mm -hmm. And so right. they, they brought this new way of thinking about things that they wanted to be quantitative mm -hmm. and they wanted to focus on minimal units. And so phage, of course, at the time, were perfect for that. If you talked about something as complex as bacteria, there was no way you could work on it in the detail of phage. And it was only after people learned more about phage and developed more tools in bacteria that it made sense to do a course on bacteria that would have that same kind of quantitative perspective. Because I, I think the hallmark of Cold Spring Harbor was bringing quantitative into biology in a way that allowed you to think about molecules. But actually, the first experiments of Luria and Delbrick were on genetic, bacterial genetics, not on phage. The phage was only a tool because they looked for T1 resistant bacteria. Right. right. But that what they got interested in bacteria, in phages while working with bacteria, and then they did more with phages. But this could not be separated. You cannot have phages without bacteria, because they <laughs> need that as a host. Right. Yeah. So the, the course no longer exists as a phage course, but it's changed into a bacterial genetics? Is that what it is it, now? It, it, advanced bacterial genetics. And have, have, did you take uh, some version of this course? I, I taught the version mm -hmm. of the course to, from 2006 to 2010. Mm -hmm. So the most recent group to survive uh, yeah. on the side of instruction. And you've taken it as well, Stan? Well, so I was a student in the course right. in, in 1981. I was a graduate student at the time. And I have to say, it changed my life. I was going to go off and do something different. And after I took the course, I said, this is what I have to do. Uh, and then I, I was lucky enough to be invited back to be an instructor. So I was an instructor between 91 and 95. How long is the course? Is it a week, two weeks? 
it, 23 days. 23 days. <laughs> 23 days that I think feels like five years yeah. because it's so intensive. So you're doing a lot of lab work, obviously, right? All day. All day. Well, yeah. lectures in the morning. Lectures. Uh, and then lab work until midnight, 1 a.m., right. 2 a.m. Do people yeah. get things done? Oh, yeah. They get do a you, lot done. Uh, do you have a focused <laughs> program? You have experiments planned out for them to do basically mm -hmm. every day? Yes. And what's the goal? To teach them how to, to do techniques? techniques? Yeah. Not really to try to get good quality publishable data, yeah. but to teach them techniques and the well, logic of but, uh, doing you know, genetics. But, but John, I think that that's one of the key things is logic. It's how to think yeah. about it. Yep. I mean, people can learn techniques from reading a lab manual, sure. but to learn how to think about it in a certain way is where the mentorship and, and also the intensity comes in. In a way, you get brainwashed in, yeah. in a good way. Yeah. So who takes the course? Students, postdocs, PIs, all, all Any, of the above? Anybody. Yeah. Many famous professors were taking mm -hmm. course at my mm -hmm. time. Leo Zillard, who was mm -hmm. the inventor of atomic pile and famous physicist, mm -hmm. he took the course here. Mm -hmm. I remember he was a pair with the Vernon Bryson, who was a biologist. Mm -hmm. but they decided to collaborate. One was flaming pipette and another was pipetting. <laughs> the trouble is physicist, Zilar was very thorough, so by the time he finished flaming and giving to Bryson, it was so hot, burn his finger. <laughs> yeah. He didn't have feeling yet for yeah. that. That's not, you don't have to yeah. make a red hot pipette just. <laughs> I, I, uh, I understand that, uh, Stan, when you took the course in 1981, one of the teachers was Lynn Enquist. Yes. So Lynn Enquist is a good friend of mine. So I asked him if he had any stories to tell. Uh -oh. And it, just this morning, his email came in. Stan was indeed one of our students in 1981. Tom Silhavi, Mike Berman, and I taught the Advanced Bacterial Genetics course at Cold Spring Harbor from 80 to 85. We took over from Botstein, Roth, and Davis. I mean, amazing people have taught this course. We published a great lab manual, one of my most cited publications on gene fusion technology and how to use them in genetic experiments. I seem to recall that Stan showed up in a Volkswagen van full of women. He was very laid back, yet energetic and enthusiastic about the science. He was an outstanding student, never broke anything, <laughs> and actually made experiments work under the very trying conditions of our genetics boot camp. Yeah. I have a few pictures of that year, and Stan had beautiful long hair. <laughs> <laughs> we'll Something have to, happened between then and now. We'll have to get those pictures. Is it true you still don't break anything in the lab? Oh. It, 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 for me, it was the funnest thing I had ever done in my life. I, I really had a, a great time. So do you think that um, you had an impact on anyone to, to go into the field as a consequence of this? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So when I took it, I mean, uh, this would be true when you took it too, um, the course was in Delbrook, and Delbrook did not have air conditioning. Mm -hmm. right? So one of the first, in this course on construction of gene fusions, the way we did it was to deliver the gene fusions with a temperature sensitive trick. Mm -hmm. But the trouble was, in the summertime yeah. in New York, sometimes it's so hot that if you don't have air conditioning, we were beyond the point yeah. <laughs> where we could keep these turned off in, right. in the lab. It was unbelievably hot. And so it was an experiment that was a wonderful experiment gone awry because of the lack of air conditioning in Delbrook Hall. Yeah. You took the phage course every year or you went to the phage oh, meeting? Oh no, I went to the phage meeting, meeting. Okay, every so that's different. year starting in 1950 and maybe ending tonight, this year, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All right, so that's the thing that always confuses me. There are courses here, mm -hmm. and then there are meetings, which are very different, right? And there's been a, there was a phage meeting for many years, which is now the meeting that's going on today. It's including bacteria and archaea, right? And so you guys must have gone to many of those as well, right? Mm -hmm. Any stories you can tell? You want to tell so them. The, so the, 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 bac the bacteria and phage meeting uh, alternates between Madison and Cold Oh, it does? Cold okay. Spring Harbor, yeah. So 
I attend the meeting in Madison more frequently just because right. I live in Iowa. It's a nice short drive. So. Sure, sure. And that's why you can go every year because sometimes it's in Madison. Yes, right? every second year. Ah, yeah. okay. So that explains it. I wonder how, so this is amazing that you went, you've gone for so many years in a row because I can imagine there's always a conflict with another meeting or something else, yet you made the point to come to this meeting. Yeah, I planned in advance either I didn't go to the meeting when it interfered, or I tried to change the date of some meetings so it would <laughs> not interfere. <laughs> but the meeting at that time was very different than now. Now there is a big affair with everything. There was a one room, there were about 30 of us in 51, 52, 50, 53. I didn't attend the first from 45. And we just entered the room. Max Delbrück was sitting there and he says, gentlemen, put your names on the blackboard and how many minutes you need. <laughs> <laughs> and then he rearranged it and made the meeting. Yeah. Because he knew what, what the time everybody of us knew what somebody else was doing because it was like family. So it was only what did they do the last year. <laughs> but otherwise, it was rather obvious what, would it, what to expect. And then there was no abstract. At the beginning, abstract was published about a month after. We had to send the abstract. And this was published. It's called Fash Information Service, PIS. In other words, I still have the total volume from the first meeting of the PIS, which then converted to the Phage meeting. Later, there were four months, the booklets started to be published. But the early one was first talk, then some months later, a, a summary abstract to be published in Fash Information Service. So how many minutes did you need in that first meeting? We were normally, the good taste is what says five minutes or ten. <laughs> there was only <laughs> once a graduate student appeared and says she needs two talks each 30 minutes. It was such a shock. How could he dare? His name was Matthew Meselson. <laughs> <laughs> because in first he wanted to describe cesium chloride gradient centrifugation and second half an hour experiment of semi-conservative replication. And this, he was a graduate student. He just showed up here. And that was the pleasure of the meeting. There are new stars appearing. And I could immediately see there were graduate students or young professor or old professor who changed the field. But if they were good, we knew immediately that that would be a future star. <laughs> Five minutes. It, it, you know something, yeah. one of the things that I, you bring up a really good point. There are a lot of meetings where people can go talk and some meetings, it's always the professors who talk and, and almost the same set of professors all the time. This meeting, it, it's, sometimes it's the young graduate student who gives the talk that blows <coughs> everyone away and there is an opportunity for students to talk and it's always, always been true here. So it, it's kind of like you are as good as your intellect, not what your title mm. is. It, it's a very different kind of place in that way. Yes, and it's such a strong impact it has. As soon as I come back from the meeting, I immediately try to find out who was, has sent analytical centrifuges. I could run it, and for the next 10 or 15 years, most of my experiments were based on cesium chloride gradient, or later I introduced cesium sulfate gradient. But this physical approach, and just after hearing the lecture by a student, Matthew Messelson. Mm -hmm. So he got two 30 minute talks? He got two 30 wow. minutes talks. <laughs> but it was worthwhile. But, yeah. It was, very, it was very well prepared. So to this day, uh, this is a mixed meeting in that sense, students and postdocs. Yes. yes. Talk. It's very good. Yeah. yeah. Have you spoken at this meeting? You must have. I have. I, I, I did when I was a student. It was a very Im impressive event. But it's changed because there are fixed times now and it's a different, brand new auditorium yeah. and there's PowerPoint and 
In the old days, there were no slides, right? Slides were not, not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> we have to use chalkboard. Yeah. If somebody didn't know how to use them, Max was giving a private lesson how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I think chalk talks are great. Oh, yeah. yep. In fact, I was at a re recent meeting. I was just listening and, and typing to a talk. And I realized I didn't have to look at the slides to understand the good speakers. The slides are just extra. You don't really need them. And if you're creative, you can give a talk without them. John, you've given talks at this meeting. You're talking tomorrow, I think. I am. Uh, I also gave a talk uh, in Madison when I was a postdoc. Right. So it was, and it was very influential. It made a big impact on me. And just to add on to the chalk talk part, I now only give chalk talks uh, for my semester long lectures mm -hmm. at the University of Iowa. Wow. The students who are listening to this as a homework assignment <laughs> might want to drop because they don't realize uh, until now that they're not going to be getting slides in advance. So the course <laughs> is on bacterial, uh, bacterial diversity. Uh, it's just an excuse to teach whatever I like and uh, teach a lot of uh, you know molecular mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know molecular basis of bacterial sure. and uh, archaeal diversity. And you uh, do this on the board. But I do chalk talks. Yes. Do you use colored chalk? Um, I no, <laughs> I don't. I do have colored chalk. I've tried it. I tried different formats and found that the chalk talk works best. It slows me down, allows yeah. students to take notes, uh, get better interactions. I actually learned that from. Uh, Stanley. Yeah. Uh, when I was at the University of Illinois, I was a graduate student, and I'd go over and uh, talk to him about experimental ideas, and he'd hand me a marker and say, "Go to the whiteboard and <laughs> tell me what your hypothesis is, and and get it out there." And then, so I learned this, uh, yeah. learned this technique, this uh, this way of doing things uh, in that environment. And so. the students don't complain about not having slides. Uh, they do at first, and then they they learn that it works very well for them. Well, you must be really good at so, it, though. Well, <laughs> because I've, re I've gotten uh, comments in the, you know, at the end of the semester saying, uh, while the, the tests were demoralizing <laughs> at times, I learned to love the chalk talk. That's great. <laughs> so, yeah. When I was a student <laughs> in the 70s, we used to go to Rockefeller once a month for the Enzyme Club, it was called. And there they would bring people in just to give chalk talks. And I remember hearing very well-known people get up there with a piece of chalk. And even by then, that was unusual because people were using slides. But they, I was impressed. Uh, they did such a great job. So, and that's still the tradition in the uh, advanced bacterial genetics yeah. course. So, uh, although occasionally someone gives a PowerPoint to mm -hmm. introduce a subject, show nice pictures or right. nice movies. Of, bacteria doing their thing, yeah. uh, we then give all the standard lectures uh, as chalk talks, which is, as you said, key to laying out the logic of an experiment. Yeah. Well, there, there's another thing about chalk talks in the course, and that is that you, you remember that John just told you it starts early in the morning and goes till way past midnight. Right. So the students are so sleep deprived. If you put up a slide and you turned off the lights, forget it. Yeah. It's all out. <laughs> yeah. um, but if you're up there writing on the board with chalk and all the lights are on, you have people's full engagement. I, I think it's hard to do that. I agree that it's good, but it's not easy to do well. I used to do it for medical students years ago. And uh, I changed the slides because it's just easier yeah. to do slides. But do, do you, what do you prefer, chalk or slides? I'm old fashioned, I like chalk because now the person has to explain things. Yeah. Not everything prepared, digested, it's, it's sometimes hard to follow. Mm -hmm. But it's elegant. I think it's, uh, it's, a, good, it's a good talent to, uh, to cultivate. So, also, yeah, the format, uh, besides of the phage meeting here, mm -hmm. very early. Much earlier, since '34, there was Cold Spring Harbor Symposia mm -hmm. in the quantitative <laughs> biology, right. which were very influential. And, and uh, but they were arranged differently. They lasted two weeks, mm -hmm. and there was two talks in the morning, afternoon three, and one talk at night. Very different than now. Yeah. And 
speaker talk for four hours, three hours. I remember George Lederberg was giving his first talk here. It started at seven, ended at one o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> halfway, he says, I have to take off my jacket. Mm. Because at that time, people had jackets and tie when they were giving lectures. So he started to unbutton himself because he was tired. You can imagine, right? <laughs> jacket and tie. Um, you, you know, Vincent, one of the things, uh, in addition, when talking about the courses, yeah. it, it's interesting to think think about the important achievements in science that, that were taught and really spread from those courses. So the phage course really got people thinking in depth about molecular biology and the nature of the gene right. that, that led to the next step of, of people moving on to central dogma. But then meanwhile, the course ended up morphing. One of the big things that came <clears throat> out of the course was the use of transposons. Mm -hmm. The many, many tricks uh, associated with use of transposons came when Davis, Botstein, and Roth were doing the course. And they spread like wildfire through the community. It was around the same time that restriction enzymes and cloning were becoming popular. And so they were mm -hmm. first introduced in that same course. Right, right. After that, the group that with Inquist and Berman and Sohavi they really introduced the world into the practical use of gene and operon fusions, changed the way people think about regulation. And, and you can go on and on. There's a series of these things that reflect the progress of science and, in fact, direct the progress of science sure. because so many people learn how to do them. Yeah, I was just looking at uh, the contemporary list of courses that you can take here. And some examples, programming for biology, uh, X-ray methods for structural biology, antibody engineering, phage display, genome access, just a couple of them. So obviously they change. It's a dynamic mm -hmm. curriculum. It changes to whatever you need to know. I would love to take the genome access course. I, can, I, I just don't have enough tools to, to look at all the sequences we have nowadays. And this would just be great for a guy like me. But Well, what about advanced bacterial genetics? Don't you want to take that? <laughs> I would, in principle, love to take it, just to have said I, I had taken it, because it sounds to me like it's a great course. I would have loved to have taken it many, many years ago, because it sounds like it was a real interesting experience. But yeah, I'd like to do them all, but there's only so much time, as you know. Uh, by the way, you were talking about these symposia. I remember as a student waiting for the volume every year, where, however frequently it came out, the Cold Spring Harbor Symposia on Quantitative Biology, remember? volumes. They probably still, uh, and in fact, behind you, behind you, Stanley, I think, are right. some of those volumes of the symposia. I remember they were, they were red volumes, and it looks like That's those right. are to me. This goes through 2007 up here. Do you know if they, they keep publishing oh, yes. these? Yes, yes. yes. Every year there is a symposium in quantitative biology. Tradition is kept up. Right. And they're very prestigious. I forgot what was this year, but there is a special subject. So really, this is a special place. You have, and we haven't mentioned that there's also research going on here. Um, there are many labs doing all sorts of things. Stanley, do you know, for example, what's going on here overall? Overall is a big question because it's so diverse. I mean, there's some really elegant work going on in plant biology. Mm -hmm. This place has been one of the hotbeds for understanding of interfer RNA interference. There is a lot of research in neurobiology going on here right now. A uh, substantial amount of work still in, on viruses and cancer. Mm -hmm. A lot of different areas. No, right now, not a lot of work on bacteria. But, but some? There is some? Not, not a lot. <laughs> okay, and no phages probably. Uh, no, genomics not really. is the key word now here. Uh, right. And cancer research and sure. neurobiology. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have research, we have courses, we have meetings, symposia. Would you say there's no other place like this in the world? I, I, well, it's very special. There is Woods Hole laboratory, mm -hmm. which also attracts many people, but right. they were normally higher organisms. 
something which was swimming in water. Well, like the Cold Spring Harbor was with phages and bacteria. Right. And corn earlier, because earlier it also started here as a classical genetic. Right. But it's totally changed over micro microbes and viruses. And, and also, not far from here, there is a, a branch of Cold Spring Harbor, the Banbury Center, which is just for meetings and conferences, which is beautiful, set in the woods, and a wonderful facility where you can go and just focus on, on your particular meeting. So it really is deserving of uh, milestones, right, Stanley? It, it is, and, and if, if there's anyone listening who hasn't been here, to me, this is, an, it's like nirvana for <laughs> a biologist, because you come here and you get your meals, and there's someone who makes your bed, and all you have to do is eat and drink and breathe science every waking minute of the day. And after a couple of days, you stop reading the newspaper and you forget that there's anything in the world other than yeah. science. And it, it really is special in that way. It allows you to begin to think in a very different perspective than you would have otherwise. You just dated but, yourself. Who reads <laughs> newspapers, Sam? Well, all right, all right. <laughs> But now it's hard to escape because everything is electronic and everyone has their cell phone and computer. So, yeah. But I know that feeling because in the old days when there wasn't electronics, you could get away and you, you forgot about the rest of the world and you almost didn't want to go back to all those problems. And I, I tell my students, you know, there's, there's uh, semester mode, there's thesis writing mode, there's yeah. conference mode, and then there's Cold Spring Harbor mode. Right. So it's get another ready. level. You, you bring it up a notch. And it's, it is a great place. I emphasize what Stanley said. You're completely surrounded and swimming in science. It's excellent. And it's a beautiful place, too. We can't yes. see from in this room, but outside we're on a harbor here, a very nice harbor, which is just beautiful. And the campus is beautiful. The buildings are very, very nice. And I always try to remember coming here to bring my bathing suits, because in addition, we go on the beach and sand spit, and that's where science goes on, <laughs> too. Yes. I got some ideas there. I know that our small, something like gradient plate, which we developed, I first discussed that with other drawing picture on the sand at the beach. So it's that stresses that day and night in dream probably too were in science. And another thing aspect which was I think still continued is it's surrounded for a very both ritzy and intellectual neighborhood. And there was tradition that people who are here or the visitor are invited for dinner parties by neighbors where uh, which was very interesting because we were then guests of Mellons and Rockefellers and, and uh, Morgans, etc. Wow. Slightly <laughs> different world. But they said that they like to invite because scientists mix well with socialites. Is that right? I never did. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you haven't had those same opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this, this uh, Cold Spring Harbor also played some role in my uh, scientific training. So I've been to a number of meetings here. And in particular, back in 1979, I met, I came here specifically to have an interview with David Baltimore. I wanted to join his lab. And he said, well, I'm going to be at the retrovirus meeting at Cold Spring Harbor. Why don't you come and we'll talk? And I, so I came here. And it was a little smaller back then. But I remember trying to find him. We had an appointment at 1 o'clock. And he wasn't where he was supposed to be. It was 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. I couldn't find him anywhere. I even went into his room. I opened the door, and all his papers were everywhere, but he wasn't there. And I said, that's it, I've had it. And I started walking back to my car. And I got to my car and I said, I can't do this. This is my career. So I went back and I found him and I had an interview and I ended up working in his lab. But it started here, among other things. So it's pretty cool. I have another story about David Baltimore. Mm -hmm. I was giving lecture at Rockefeller Institute around the 60s. And uh, professor, which was 
Franklin who invited me, says you have to meet with students too. We were sitting around the table and students were telling what they were doing and there was a young student who said that my experiments, what I am doing, they're so important. That was polyprotein cutting that I will get Nobel Prize for it. Wow. And then I will be a director of Rockefeller Institute. <laughs> and, and that was David Bolton. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. Yeah, yeah he was yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. He got a Nobel Prize and he became uh, he the director. Got director of, of, the, of the institution when I was giving yes. lecture then. <laughs> he was brash, for <laughs> sure. Would say but so. a really good scientist, too. So today they're going to have a little ceremony, Stanley, to dedicate this plaque. Can you right. tell us what's going so, to happen? So we'll have a little ceremony and say a few words about the importance of Cold Spring Harbor in microbiology. And then Jim Watson's going to say some things about his early experience mm -hmm. in the phage course. And um, a few other people will, will talk. We're going to have a, I think it'll be a really nice ceremony. We'll unveil the plaque at that time. Mm -hmm. and. It's nice because we have a, a, this large audience of people who are at this meeting and, and people who really care and interface with the ASM and with Cold right. Spring Harbor Laboratory. So it's so great to bring the groups together. And the plaque will be there forever and people right. can see it and they'll look at it and say, wow, cool, I didn't know that. Right. right. So hopefully we can get some footage of that. That would yeah. be great. Sounds like it'll be a good ceremony. So uh, that would be after the lecture of mm -hmm. uh, Beckwith. That's after yes. Beckwith's lecture and before cocktails. So a very privileged time. That's <laughs> after Beckwith lecture. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before we finish up, we always like to have some science on TWIM. And that's where you fit in, John. Hmm. John, you are at the University of <laughs> Iowa, right? Tell us your history. Where did you come from? Were you born in the U.S.? Yes. Where? Uh, <laughs> That's funny. I was born in <laughs> I was born in Des Moines, Iowa. Wow! Of all places, so I've actually gone back full circle. Then didn't uh, fall far from the tree. Huh? Yeah, right. Now I grew up in Northern Illinois, and I did my undergraduate at the University of Illinois, and then I did my PhD at the University of Illinois as well <clears throat> okay. in biochemistry. Biochem, okay. Yes, uh, and of course I was lucky enough to be working on. Uh, biochemistry, uh, you know, biochemical modifications of proteins and bacteria, and so I saw the light, you know, and <laughs> talked to uh, the microbiologists uh, mm. at, at the University of Illinois, and so I was fully indoctrinated by uh, people like Stanley and right. John Cronin and Jim Imlay and, mm -hmm. and Abigail Sayers and right. that crowd. Right. Right. So they, yeah, they made a huge impact on me, and then, and then I went and did a postdoc uh, at Berkeley in David Zussman's lab, mm -hmm. working on Mexicaca xanthus. And then I took my first position as an assistant professor at Georgia Tech uh, in 2002. And then I moved back to Iowa as a position became available at the mm -hmm. end of 2006, 2007. So I then was an associate professor there, or hired as an associate professor there. So, so now you work on myxobacteria. So I do work on myxobacteria, Myxococcus xanthus in particular. The myxobacteria uh, group is getting larger and larger as we find mm -hmm. more uh, isolates. These are incredibly interesting organisms. Uh, <laughs> they, I would say that the, the majority of those that have been studied, uh, you know, the hallmark feature is that they live out their life uh, as a multicellular unit. Mm -hmm. So I like to joke with my students that they're the missing link. Uh, <laughs> and it, but it, it's amazing. Uh, these bacteria do everything collectively. Uh, so they communicate with each other uh, using mm -hmm. uh, everything from small molecules, uh, probably molecules that look like antibiotics or are antibiotics if they're produced in high concentration industrially. Mm -hmm. uh, they communicate with these small molecules, uh, small proteins. Uh, Transfer proteins uh, mm -hmm. between uh, between cells. It, whole whole patches of membrane seem to be uh, transferred, mm -hmm. uh, possibly through uh, vesicles, etc. These cells organize, form large, very large structures. One one million uh, cells form a structure called a, a fruiting body, and inside this fruiting body, you get uh, differentiation into spores, so that these cells can. Uh, mm -hmm 
uh, survive harsh conditions. But the other thing that they do that's very interesting is they uh, hunt down other bacteria in the soil, um, and they so they're act, active predators, and they, mm -hmm. they help keep things in check. So they eat they eat these other bacteria. Yes. So they're soil dwellers. They're soil dwellers. Are there lots of them in the soil out there? There are lots of them in the soil. <laughs> so I would say Streptomyces and, and the mix of bacteria are uh, two of the major species mm -hmm. that give the soil its nice earthy smell. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's, they're present everywhere and they've been found on, uh, I think every, every continent where they've been sought. And yeah, they're really, uh, they're ubiquitous. John, why don't you tell us about the classic rabbit turd <laughs> approach to finding <laughs> mixobacteria. Yeah, so yeah, it's a, an experiment that uh, students can do in a, uh, in a lab class in sh fairly short order, you can go out and find uh, some animal dung, uh, rabbit turds, as Stanley pointed out. Get a little soil from around that uh, rabbit turd, <laughs> and you can treat the treat the uh, the food source uh, with uh, anti uh, antifungals to keep fungus from growing up. But then after a few days, what you see is fruiting bodies growing on the uh, on the animal dung. And so you can isolate new strains of uh, mixobacteria doing this. It's, it's a simple experiment to get soil bacteria to, uh, you know, utilize the nutrients that are available in, in that uh, rabbit turd or whatever uh, source you want. Uh, and then they go through this starvation mode and they build these, uh, these fruiting mm -hmm. bodies. And so then you can, and they're visible to the naked eye. And so you can pick them up with a toothpick and and move forward. So the reason you you take the soil around the, the dung is because it's attracted the mixobacteria to begin with? The, the bacteria are likely to be there and not necessarily inside right. uh, the animal. But they would be attracted by the bacteria in the dung perhaps? Is that? Uh, possibly, yeah, and any other nutrients. So uh, yeah. yes, so the uh, mixobacteria can break down. Some species of yeah. mixobacteria can, can break down uh, complex uh, you mm -hmm. know, plant materials. So, so they, they typically are in the upper levels of the soil, not too deep, is that right? As far as I know, yes. Um, I don't really know what the uh, maximum depths yeah. <laughs> are for, for that. I mean, most, most of the work that I've seen going on in the, on the ecology side has been sampling, you know, just a Ooh. few centimeters. Right. Okay. So are you, are you uh, giving a talk here on mixobacteria? Uh, I am. Uh, Are you the only mixo person here at this meeting? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll be talking about signal transduction in, in mixobacteria. Okay. In Sorry, Stan. Okay. Yes. Well, so I, I, I was going to ask a question first. I thought mixobacteria were uh, strict aerobes. Is, is that incorrect? It, it, it relates to how deeply you would uh, find them in the soil. Oh, you should know this. <laughs> Well, it's, he's caught on camera. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I'm thinking about the term strict, you know. I, okay. Yeah. In, All right. They're they, permissive they, aerobes. All right. <laughs> um, I, but technically, yeah. Yeah, they're aerobes. Yeah, but yeah. I, I think that the important thing about... There's, there's an anaerobic mixobacter species that can uh, grow on alternative uh, terminal electron acceptors, uranium included. So not all mixobacteria <laughs> are, are aerobes. Are you going to still assign this to your class? Uh, yes. Yeah, they should see that. <laughs> right. you know, yeah. Good exactly. save. <laughs> so did you bring people from your lab with you to this I, meeting? I did not, no. Uh, it's, it's one of those summers where there were seven yeah. meetings to go to, and so we, we took turns going to different So conferences. can you give us a uh, preview of what you're going to talk about? Uh, so one of the so Mixo, uh, Mixococcus xanthus uh, is, has, a, has a huge genome, over 9 million bases. So mm -hmm. larger than yeast, twice the size of E. coli. Been sequenced in total? Sequenced in total, um, resequenced uh, <laughs> a couple of times. And what's interesting is nearly 10% of the genome is dedicated to signal transduction. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow is dissection, molecular dissection of a particular uh, signal transduction system mm -hmm. that is required in part for the transition from a vegetative cell into a spore. Okay. So, so can you do classical genetics of 
Myxococcus? Absolutely. You can do all the usual things. You can put DNA in, you can disrupt genes. Yes. Are there plasmids? There, uh, there is a plasmid uh, that can be used. Mm -hmm. There are many phage that have mm -hmm. been isolated. Uh, Dale Kaiser uh, pioneered mm -hmm. uh, the use of phage in the 70s yeah. uh, if, uh, for myxobacteria, and so uh, we use, we utilize a couple of phage uh, you know, to do a lot mm -hmm. of our genetics. Yeah. We can, we can electroporate the cells for the kids out there. You can right. you know, zap them. So you can do it. Yeah. You can interrogate you can do, genes. You, you can, can do what you do what you want. Yeah. And we did a we did a transposon mutant hunt mm -hmm. here in the in the course uh, three consecutive years and hit the same genes three consecutive years. So we know those genes are important. We haven't uh, completed that study yet, mm -hmm. but uh, we we got very interesting uh, results. So I read a paper of yours yesterday, and the title is "Deciphering the Hunting Strategy of a Bacterial Wolf Pack." Yeah. So why are you describing Myxococcus as a wolf pack? Because it does its work uh, collectively. Ah. So the, it, yes. <laughs> so uh, Myxo will, uh, will take apart other micro colonies of bacteria that it, it finds in yeah. the in environment. And, so, and that's how we carry out our studies as well. So we, we allow uh, Myxo to organize and attack. Right. Uh, colonies of, of bacteria and it's pretty amazing uh, behavior. If, mm -hmm. you, if you, We make uh, time-lapse movies and then mm -hmm. play them back rather quickly and they look relatively aggressive. Wow. <laughs> so you can you put a colony on a plate and then you put Myxococcus next to it and they will swarm towards it? Yes. And they'll wow. wipe them out. Any bacterial species? Um, most of what we've tested. Uh, so Myxo will eat uh, E. coli and bacillus, mm -hmm. uh, it will eat yeast. Uh, we've even fed it some phage. So it likes to, it likes or has a taste for uh, mm -hmm. macromolecules. Fungi? Uh, some, yes. Yeah. Does it eat oil? Or not? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so make it practical. <laughs> <laughs> not, the, not the species that I'm working on, but that's where we uh, found the anaeromyxobacteria. It was isolated from uh, Oak Ridge. Uh, Super fun site. Hmm. So it is eating some things uh, that are considered to be toxins. Remediation. Yes. Yeah, involvement. Yeah. So, so, so the the wolf pack strategy uh, we think is you know strength in numbers. The yeah. individual an individual mixo cell wouldn't be uh, able to secrete enough lytic enzymes or degradative mm -hmm. enzymes to to do damage to a microcolony of. of uh, e. coli or bacillus or whatever it might find out there. So, so can you make a mutant that doesn't make a fruiting body or doesn't collaborate and see what it can do to a to a prey? We are doing that kind of work right now. Uh, okay. Yes, that's an excellent question. <laughs> but there's probably more than one gene involved in that, right? Yes, yeah. there there are, and lots of uh, you know, there's seven thousand five hundred. Uh, known open reading frames. Uh, right. These are the traditionally large open reading frames. I'm not even talking about small RNAs right. or, or small peptides <laughs> here. Uh, so at least 7,500 genes on the on the genome, and half of them are differentially regulated during development, and a very large uh, right. subset of genes are affected during predation, and you re it requires motility uh, and you know, mm -hmm. all the, the use of all of the uh, molecular uh, right. armament to attack other cells. So we have a lot of mutants that are incapable, uh -huh. uh, but we're, we're going through uh, some of the traditional, uh, traditional right. genes to see what's required. What would happen if you put uh, these bacteria in an animal, a mouse or some other kind of host? Do they cause disease? Uh, no, uh, they don't cause disease. Um, no known uh, pathogenic mix of bacteria. Uh, in fact, I'd argue that it's part of the hygiene hypothesis that mm -hmm. the kids that are out playing in the dirt are healthier because they're <laughs> exposed to these these sorts of bacteria. Right. Uh, you know the yeah sure the pioneering microbiome work. Uh, most bacteria are good for us, but they're not part of our microbiome. Right? They are not part of our microbiome. No. It sounds like you might be able to use them to treat infections. I. Hope someday we can do that. 
I think it says uh, something about, you know, mud packs and yeah. <laughs> things like that. It's probably really good for you to get dirty. <laughs> we, I think we ought to have a twim just with John. I mean, this is a great topic. You have to come back sometime I by would, Skype and talk in more detail absolutely about what you're do doing. That. But what's, give me a sense of the size of the uh, mixobacterial community. How many people are doing research on it? Oh, it's a, I would say it's a very healthy yeah. community. Um, 15 or so labs in the United States, another uh, 10 to 15 labs in Europe. I, I can't keep track yeah. because there's a lot of postdocs yeah. moving yeah. to start their own labs. But it's we have an international meeting every year. Mm -hmm. uh, usually get in the ballpark of 60 people or so showing up for that. In fact, next year our plan is to uh, go to China uh, and have our first mixo mm -hmm. meeting in China. There are uh, several mixo labs in, in yeah. Asia, but we don't usually interact with them. So trying to find a way to increase that mm -hmm. collaborative effort. You know something, that the quality of a field's not just the number of people in it, but the intellectual fervor of the people in it. And I think the Mixel field has mm -hmm. a, a very impressive group of, of real creative, innovative scientists. Yeah. For me, Mixel bacteria reminds me also Dale Kaiser, yeah. because he was one of the phage group who grew up in Cold Spring Harbor with our meeting. Yes. Is he still active? Uh, he's retired now, but yes, he's yeah. you know, he, somewhat active. Yeah, he was very yeah. influential in the phage group. Yes. So he, he transplanted spirit, transplanted the spirit. He did a lot for the field because as, as you know, he came from uh, phage genetics and then yeah. took those tools and moved them into the, the mixo field. He just presented a poster at the ASM meeting in San Francisco uh, in June, so wow. yeah. he's still active. So that's an example of influence of phage group and of Cold Spring Harbor yeah. where we are now. Yes. Well, I think there's one other aspect of, of Dale with respect to this, but he set the standard for intellectual quality in this field. Mm -hmm. And very often you see that fields that are really good and rigorous, there was some person who came in there and just really set the stage. And, and Dale Kaiser is that guy. Mm -hmm. My last question for you, is it tough to get funding for mixobacterial research? It's harder. Harder uh, than anything else? Yeah, I, m more of our funding uh, more of the funding in the mixo field now comes from NSF than it does from NIH. Right. I would guess that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, it was easier to make the argument that since we were looking at <clears throat> intercellular communication right. and uh, systems that were clearly involved in biofilm formation or antibiotic right. resistance, that we could, you know, we could argue uh, the relevance for NIAID sure. or uh, any other organization in NIH. But that's much more difficult these days. Yeah, well, if you can find ways to treat. To use it as an antimicrobial, then you can get into NIH. Well, it eats Staph aureus, and uh, you know, I want to find a way to clean up the mess in the hospital. Sure, <laughs> sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Any, anything else on your mind, Stanley? I'm going to wrap it up. Then. It sounds like a good idea. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, you can find Twim, which is what we've been recording, at iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace, and if you like Twim, you should subscribe in iTunes and leave a comment or rate the, the podcast. It helps us to stay visible when you do that, and a lot of people will find us, and we want more people to hear the message that we're trying to deliver about microbes. We also have an app that you can use to listen to TWIM. It's at microbeworld.org. And we always like getting your questions and comments. We didn't answer any of them today because this is a special episode. But if you do, we'd love to read them on the show and, and talk about them. Send them to twim at twiv.tv. And I want to thank everyone for participating today in this special uh, episode of TWIM at Cold Spring Harbor. Stan Malloy is at San Diego State University. Thank you, Stanley. Thank you so much, Vincent. This was great fun. Stanley's going to be at the uh, dedication saying a few words later on, yes. right? And you came in on the red eye, and you're pretty good for coming in on the red eye. Yeah. Sharp. You know, sleep is overrated. I, always th <laughs> I thought you might be falling asleep here. Yeah. John Kirby's at the University of Iowa. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Oh, sure. I, I love what you're doing with this podcast. I, it's my home page on my office computer. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yep. We couldn't do it without you guys. Yeah. 
got to do the research to talk about. Well, we'll have you back and we can talk in more depth That'd about great. some of your work. It's a lot of fun to do that. And we'll put on Alio and Michael Schmidt. Yeah. And they can be curious. <laughs> Vaslav Shabolsky is at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Thank you so much for coming. I always like to help bacteriology and microbiology in Old Spring Harbor. So it's a pleasure. My pleasure. And I have to have a question for you. There's a book behind you with your name on it. Do you know what that is? It was some sort, when I was offered this room, a portrait by Jim Watson got it for me. And uh, there is something about me, about my family, about where I came from. And the book on one hand, and then on the plaque on the other, ah, over yeah, the door. And uh, I always like to stress that I'm a Polish scientist. And, and also my favorite city is was Lwów in Poland, which I lost. I lost my home city. It was given by Mr. Roosevelt to Mr. Stalin, and it was ethnically cleaned. So it's now something else. But I just wanted to leave some little memory about the place where I grew up. Well, this room is certainly full of uh, your memories. There's a great plaque above the door about you and what you've done in your career and where you are from. I have to tell you one more thing. My wife is, was, is a PhD. She got her PhD working on phage, a phage of Bacillus studilis called Phi 105. And she came to this, to the phage meeting or the bacterial genetics meeting um, in the 70s. And she wanted me to tell you this because she said at the dance, she square danced with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you probably don't remember her, but her, her mother was Polish, in fact. And she said, tell him that I square danced with him at Cold Spring Harbor. Tell her I remember. <laughs> and I danced, we danced here every meeting of page meeting and symposium. Dr. McDowell was fantastic about square dance and he also organized it. We had a course of square dancing <laughs> at the time when I was on the staff here and I, it was a lot of fun. Square dancing at Cold Spring Harbor. Did you ever square dance? I did. You did? I did. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. By you, I did not. All right. <laughs> you are too young. It's not too late, though. We can get yeah. you started. You and me tonight. <laughs> right. He's yeah. young enough. To... <laughs> <clears throat> I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at my blog, virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for supporting TWIM, Communications Director Barbara Hyde, and Chris Condian and Ray Ortega. And in fact, Ray is running the boards. Thanks a lot, Ray. And Sam, is that, that right? Thanks for helping us, Sam. You're from here at Cold Spring Harbor. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Oh.